Oh, I just started the recording button, so I'm going to say again for those who are listening uh, after the fact, welcome to the ISA Marketing and Sales Summit webinar on LinkedIn. I'm Sherry Worthington, um, and I am a um, volunteer member um, with the ISA Marketing and Sales Group, part of the management division. Uh, we do all sorts of interesting things, including the upcoming ISA Marketing and Sales Summit, which I'll talk about in a sec. Um, our speaker today is Joel Don. I'll get to that in just a minute as well. So let me just quickly, I got a couple slides here and then I'll be quiet and turn things over to Joel. Um, most of you probably know uh, the International Society of Automation, ISA. Um, they have their big annual conference coming up this fall. I hope all, we'll see all of you there as well. And uh, we've got lots of different things going on. New books, lots of education. Um, there's the major conference in the fall and then um, the divisions within ISA. So water, wastewater, uh, ChemPID. There's all sorts of different divisions. The management division all have their own little symposia as well where you can get specialized information focused on a particular topic. Uh, we also do a lot of standards work. I would assume some of you are involved in that or others that you work with are. And let me just quickly introduce you to, uh, if you haven't been, the ISA Marketing and Sales Summit is coming up September in New Orleans this year. So we've got the gorgeous W Hotel. Um, we will have basically two and a half days of conference. So we start Wednesday morning, September 11th with a tour of a local plant. Uh, we're still in negotiations on that, so I can't release the name yet. Um, and then we go through Friday lunch, uh, and we end with the infamous Dick Morley, who has a very interesting topic this year on human pack size. Pack, P-A-C-K, yep, pack size, and what that has to do with marketing and sales and how we can deal with the information. There's a new research out on the ideal pack size. He's going to talk about that. And um, and you know Dick, uh, for those of you who do know him, he stretches your brain in new directions. It's always interesting. Um, one of the, the, the best parts I'm looking forward to is actually the plenary session Wednesday evening, um, which is kind of the official launch of the conference portion. Um, we had an I don't know how many of you are really active on social media, but during the Boston Marathon crisis, we had interesting things crop up from a, a marketing and sales perspective. You know, there was the, the crisis happening, lots of, of, even the news media, the major news media were using Twitter as a channel to get information from the Boston police and the firefighters and people on the scene. And, you know, you'd be watching all the news and I'm here in the Boston area, so I was watching very closely and all of a sudden, you know, some marketing or sales message would crop up. And it's like, you know, get that annoying stuff out of the way. I'm focused on what's going on with the crisis, as as were many people um, around the world, because this is a, a big, monstrous event, the, the marathon. So um, we ended up with a lot of discussions afterwards on what do you do with social media during a crisis? Do you pause what you've got planned? Do you stop tweeting? Do you stop sending email? We even had editors actually um, request that you stop sending press releases because they were focused on what's going on with the news related to the event. So there's a lot of implications here for marketing and sales. What do we do when there's a crisis? How big is a crisis is big, uh, that's big enough to make us stop what we're doing and, fo and let people just focus on the news angle. So anyway, that's going to be discussed in a plenary session. Uh, we have a round table that's going to be addressing that and I expect that to be a very lively discussion. Um, anyway, so that's the Marketing and Sales Summit. We hope that you, we will see you there. Please register online. Registration is open. There is a um, uh, early bird fee available until June 15th. Um, I am now going to be quiet and Joel, I'm about to turn the screen over to you. All right, you ready? Go right ahead. Alrighty, so I'd like to turn things over to Joel Don, who is currently uh, the community manager for ISA. So he's managing all the um, social media uh, interactions going on within ISA, um, you know, Twitter, the blog. Facebook, um, YouTube, there's all sorts of stuff going on, of course. And Joel has been uh, working in that position for 
uh, for a while now. And he's also um, a former journalist who works in the public relations and brand management fields. Um, he's got an interesting perspective because of the whole news angle as well as being within the marketing and sales um, function as well. So um, Joel had this idea to talk about LinkedIn and he's got some great stuff here. I am now going to be quiet and turn it over to Joel. Welcome, Joel. Thank you, Sherry. It's a, it's a pleasure and thank everyone uh, for, uh, for being here today, uh, whether you're on the West Coast, um, in which case it's um, 9 in the morning East Coast or somewhere else in the world. Um, really looking forward, really excited about talking about LinkedIn um, and how to use it uh, to do uh, things that we never thought we really could do with it or to do it more effectively and that's uh, prospecting, promoting, selling in obviously what we really want to do when we're investing uh, time and resources is to succeed. Um, the thing about LinkedIn, sorry about that, let me go to the first slide is you ask um, you know why, why LinkedIn and um, compared to you know all your other choices and you have other choices you have Facebook and YouTube and you have Twitter, uh, StumbleUpon, Google Plus, you know, all of these other social channels um, take up a lot of your time. So why spend time at LinkedIn? What's, what's the value proposition? You know, what does it offer? And, and how can you successfully use it for, for marketing and sales? Uh, remember that LinkedIn is really distinct from all of the other social channels. It's a pure business network. It's greater than 200 million users. Um, and I just want to say that a lot of people say, well, yes, but how many are active users? When you started getting into active users, you can ask the same things about Google Plus or Facebook. The main thing is the, the active users are the ones that you're going to be engaging with when you're using LinkedIn, and those are the ones you'll be most concerned with. There are a large number of people using LinkedIn and more all the time. So it is an extremely active. It is not a static network. Um, it certainly is not, um, and I don't agree with the... the um, comments that are made about Google Plus being a ghost town. I don't think either of, of these social channels um, is lacking for users or lacking for activity. Um, it's a place where you can do one thing that's really important. You can combine your profile, who you are, your background, your work, and your education, and everything, and you can use all of that and, and apply that in a way that makes it a very valuable business intelligence service. Uh, most of the data is extremely accurate. Why? Because the companies and the individuals that put the information up there, their intent and their goal should be to put up the most accurate information available. So it's great. It's free business intelligence. The other thing that I want us all to remember is that this is not a static resume site. Um, and it's not that if you engage. That's really key. It's leveraging LinkedIn, maximizing it, the opportunity with LinkedIn. If you view it as a static resume site, it's just a place to put up your business card, then that's all it will be. And some people use it for that. But you can use it uh, as an active site. You can use it to sell. So the question is, what is LinkedIn? It is a network. And that's the most important thing. And there are three aspects of LinkedIn. There, the first is how you show up. Second is what you share. The third is how you share. And this is really important. Just three fundamental rules for how you work with LinkedIn. And how you show up uh, is largely how you present your profile. That's the first thing that LinkedIn asks you to do is create an extensive profile. And let's just look at the ground rules. When LinkedIn started, the whole idea, if, if you can remember way back when, was they said that you're only to connect with people that you know. I will have to admit that that has changed over the years. Um, there's also something called the LinkedIn Open Network. So you can identify yourself as an open networker, and that basically says anyone who wants to connect with me, connect with me can. Um, some people agree with that strategy. Others do not. I have been on both sides of the fence on whether you should be a LinkedIn Open Networker or a lion, as they're called. But the one thing about setting up um, your profile and this is still specified in the rules today, is you're only allowed to have one LinkedIn account. Okay? Your, your user profile um, has to be a person. And that's really important. I'm going to tell you today, don't be a logo. There are a lot of people who show up as logos, who uh, have a 
personal profile and a logo to go with that from their company, or they just they they go on and they say, hey, I'm just going to be this company and here's my logo and this is how I'm going to interact. You can do that. And I've noticed that LinkedIn doesn't police that, but what LinkedIn will not do, if you look into the rules, is they will not offer any one customer service if it's not a natural person. So uh, if you set up a profile as a company and attempt to get help, they won't help you. Uh, the profile image, it should be your photo and a good photo. Uh, my friend Neil Schaefer, who's an author, he's written two books on LinkedIn said it quite well in his first book. If you are a business and you plan to put a business name as your name, don't even bother. Okay, It's a social network. It's about professionals and people. Now, there are two things you can do. You can set up groups, and I'm not going to talk about setting up groups, why you should set up a group, or you know what theme you should set up a group for. But I will note that if you do have a company, you can set up a company page. And it's very similar if you've set up a company page uh, for on Facebook. You can do very much the same kinds of things. And there are a lot of advantages to having a company page and developing followers, just like you do for a Facebook page. So if you're wondering what you should do because you want to show up in, uh, in groups and you want to show up as a person, but you also want to represent your company, you actually are doing that anyway. But if you want to have a company presence, go ahead and set up a company page. You'll be very happy with the results from that. Um, your profile. This is a, another thing is you need to make sure that you create a robust profile. Fill out all the fields. Use a professional photo. Don't use a webcam shot. Um, don't use something that you wouldn't um, bring to a new employer and say, this is my professional photo I want posted in the company's intranet, for example. So use that as the standard. Don't forget to put a headline in your profile and include websites or links. This can be um, links to a blog, website, it can even be a link to an article. I've seen people do this. So you're allowed to have up to three of them and utilize those fields and you get to those uh, websites or those links by clicking on, clicking on the contact information. Um, remember to polish your summary. Uh, make sure that you get all your experience, your specialties, your skills and expertise, your education and organizations. Uh, I see a lot of incomplete uh, profiles. I see education missing. This is important. When you're selling, when you're marketing, when somebody goes to look at you further, they're going to look for your full background. If things are missing, things are incomplete, or as in some cases where I've seen somebody copy and pasted their resume directly from a Word document into the profile field in LinkedIn, and all the character returns didn't work right, so it's just sort of a jaggedy, raggedy mess. You need to make sure that you polish that up, remove all those codes that can sometimes transfer over from other applications that you're using where you have your resume. Joel, I, I don't yeah. know if I mentioned this to you before, but um, my daughter actually, my 20-year-old daughter is hired by LinkedIn to review profiles. So mostly she's going around looking at um, big names, CEOs from large corporations and things like that to make sure they're real. And they've given her a list of guidelines and she looks at a lot of profiles, but basically she's there to let them know what looks like a real person and what looks like just, you know, a fake static you know, um, either a fake or someone not really active. So it's interesting they're keeping track of it using real people as well. Right. Um, well, I can just do a real quick aside, and I don't want to use much time for that. When I was a newspaper reporter, uh, I prepared a long feature story on a woman who did, a, did some very interesting things. And um, she had amazing credentials. She had gone to Stanford University and graduated with honors and so forth. It was just a great story. Something happened in the middle of, of preparing this story for print, and I decided to call Stanford and just verify her credentials. She never gone to Stanford. The story was killed. <laughs> Oops. And um, uh, the newspaper would would never do a story or entertain this person again. You you uh, LinkedIn, it's the same thing. Whatever information you post there, it's there. It has to be a hundred percent accurate. That includes all of the dates, the times, the things you did, and enhance all that. If you went to um, university and you didn't complete, you can put notations in it that you attended and what you did. Um, you can ex you can explain um, certain things. So um, it's not a problem if you have incomplete work. 
Um, but do know that employers, uh, prospects, people who are doing business with you, they're going to check your resume out. They're going to compare it to the real world and make sure that it holds up. So it's no different than uh, in this particular slide. You show up at a business meeting and you throw your business card out. When you're presenting yourself, you've got your LinkedIn profile to back you up. And that, that is your business card, but it's a lot more. It really tells somebody a lot of things about you, and it tells them something more. It tells them how to reach you. It also tells them how to reach your company. And when they reach your company, they reach to your products and services, and that's what you're selling. So if we get into the profile, this, this is sort of a one-two punch here. There are two parts to selling and marketing on LinkedIn. The first part is your profile. That's like the anchor. The second part is what you share, what you do with that profile, how you engage, extend yourself throughout the LinkedIn network. So I like to talk about the profile to make sure we have our profiles in order. You, when you go to the check your settings section, and um, you may think, well, I've already done this. But what you don't know is LinkedIn has made changes over the last several years. And your settings may not be exactly the way you think they are. And you may not be aware of some of the things that have been changed recently. So you need to go back and check your profile, check how uh, you're set up for communications, set up for groups, companies, and applications, and your general account settings. The first thing you need to consider is your broadcasting. What you're telling the world in terms of the changes that you make to your profile. Do you want to broadcast to everybody that you changed companies, that you changed uh, details about your education or your background or your experience. Some people um, may want to not disclose this for specific strategic reasons. And um, the reasons might be competitive issues. You don't want competitors to know that you're changing this or changing that. You may not want your current employer to know. And you may not want to share some of your prospecting research that you're doing that's reflected in changes to your profile. You know, a good example of this was someone uh, who worked for me changed uh, the fact that she was also working for another company, and then a client called me for my PR and social media consultants. Says, what, what happened to this person that we're all working with? It looks like she's changed jobs. Well, she hadn't changed jobs. She had changed her LinkedIn resume, and it miscommunicated what exactly had happened. So be aware that your broadcasting changes to everyone, and while you're making those changes, if you don't want the whole world to see it, you may want to perhaps disengage this feature. So you use this strategically. You may want to turn it on and off at different times depending on your goals and objectives. Um, the other thing is your activity feed. You know, who can see this feed? You've got everyone, your network, your connections, and only you. And There's a lot of confusion about what does this exactly mean. So just so we're clear, your connections are all your first degree people. Those are the people that you're connected to directly. Your network is, are, are all the people that are in the first, second, and third degree. So your first degrees are connected to your seconds, and your seconds are created to your thirds. And those are relations that you may want to have down the road. So you may want to consider whether you want to broadcast to all of them or not. Again, it's going to be different for different applications and for different strategies, depending on what kinds of products, services you are selling. Uh, what I call the LinkedIn cookies. Uh, select what others can see when you view their profile. Um, this uh, kind of makes people a little antsy because you can change your um, viewership to exactly who you are, sort of an anonymous reference to who you are, and totally anonymous. Um, there are a lot of reasons why you might want to do um, a total anonymous approach to uh, letting people see when you view their profile. You don't want to reveal to companies that you're looking at them for competitive reasons. You may be job or career hunting, or you may be recruiting. You just may want to be under their radar and don't want to reveal yourself to them. And there's a flip side to this. You may actually, and I do this, I want to reveal myself to a company. I want somebody to know that I'm looking at them. I'm interested in doing business with them. So I kind of want to poke them very quietly. So by having my identity turned on, that's my way of saying hello in a different kind of way. And the same thing for job and career hunting or the same thing for recruiting. 
if a recruiter starts viewing my profile, for example, I wonder why is this recruiter over other recruiters taking a look at me? You know, I may want to contact that recruiter. Hello, uh, I noticed that you uh, were looking at me. Was, was, did you, is there an opportunity you're thinking about surfacing? So there are a lot of different strategic reasons you may want to um, leverage this particular setting. It is very dynamic and you can change it at any time. So the other thing that LinkedIn lets you see is who's viewed your profile. I will say that I do have uh, a premium account. I, I can talk about this uh, offline if anyone's interested in the advantages. There are, there are some advantages to paying for a LinkedIn account. You don't have to. You get a, a lot of data without a paid account. But I can tend to see a few more things than the average basic account. Um, one of the things I can see more people who viewed my profile. So uh, when people do view my profile, I can see uh, people who are sharing exactly uh, all their details. And here's the, here we'll show you what it looks like when it's sort of semi-anonymous. And there, here's a totally anonymous person. So I have no idea who this is. It's just a LinkedIn member. And in the old days, LinkedIn did it um, where it basically said anonymous. So they've changed the language to make it more professional. Um, I prefer seeing LinkedIn member than seeing anonymous user. Uh, the other thing that LinkedIn does, and you probably get these emails as long as you have all these features engaged, is um, I'll get an email update. So when, when I get a certain set of people, I'll get an update letting me know that a certain number of people have viewed my profile. I can go look at who's viewed my profile. Maybe these are people I want to do business with. Maybe these are people who are members of groups I might want to join and start engaging with them. Uh, you never know uh, where the opportunities may lie, and I find this to be very valuable intelligence. I pay attention to this all the time. Um, if you want to know who can see your connections, you basically get two cho choices here. Your connections are only you. So this is something that you want to consider in terms of do you want to let your network get exposed. Um, and note that uh, people will always be able to see shared connections. So that's a sort of caveat to this setting. Um, your photo. I, I, some people don't want to share their photo with the wide network. I share it with everyone. Uh, I don't think that you want to show up with a gray um, placeholder image. So I advise everyone to have a great photo and, and share it everywhere. And remember, uh, again, connections are your first degree. Your network, as they're referring to, is the first, second, and third degree. Uh, so if you wanted to restrict it all, I guess you might choose your network, but uh, I don't see there's any disadvantage to doing everyone. Um, show hide viewers, uh, this profile will also viewed box. So here's another setting that you can do, and um, you should decide uh, which way you'd like to go with it. And the advantage of this is, well, somebody looks uh, at my profile and I get to see who they're looking at. In this case, this is actually from my profile. And when I look at this list, these are all authors at a, a particular social me, uh, social business portal that um, I write for. And these are all the authors here. So someone hit my profile and then hit all the other authors at this blog site. So I found that interesting. Now how I might use this is if I see patterns in people who are viewing my profile, that gives me an idea of, of you know, what's triggering people, what's interesting people in, when they're doing their searching. So it helps me to get a good idea of what I might have that is similar to the people that are also being viewed. And I want to learn more about all those people who are also being viewed. In this case, it's pretty easy. They're all authors of the same blog, although they're all in different professions. And here's one of the newer kind of settings that was done by LinkedIn for all the good reasons, which is how you show up to the internet, how you show up to Google, Yahoo, and Bing. You want to make sure you click on this one and make sure that your profile is visible to everyone if you want to be easily searched via Google or Yahoo or Bing. And you can get very granular with these settings, as you can see. Um, I just said everything. You can see everything, but you may not want to uh, enable this for go a Google search. I, I think it's to everyone's advantage to be 100% um, public, but you may not want to be. Depends on whether you want to be found or not. Again, this is a uh, personal and professional choice. 
based on your sales and marketing strategy, what your goals and objectives are. Now, in showing up, I think most people see that LinkedIn is a network, it's professionals, it's people who are dressed for success, it's uh, people who are meeting to do business. Um, and this is how you want to show up. How you don't want to show up is like this. And uh, you would be surprised <laughs> or not surprised, but I would say in my role uh, now as the community manager for ISA, and now that I'm actively managing a LinkedIn group, I see a mix of both of these. I see and way I, too many of those. <laughs> uh, the ones on the right? Yes. Um, I, 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 I do see that, and I so much want to help the person on the right be like the person on the left. And I'm going to tell you now, I, I, I didn't say this at the beginning, but I'll say now, if you will follow through to the end of this presentation, I will show you how by adding only five more minutes of your time, to your very business, busy schedule in all the social channels that you have to participate in. I'm asking for five more minutes of your time so that you are not showing up as the person on the right and you show up as the people on the left. So that's my promise and guarantee, five minutes. And I can make sure that you're not walking around with a sandwich sign saying, hey, I have this for you. The first thing is when you're presenting yourself, uh, publicly your first opportunity to engage is going to your home page and just doing general posts, general status updates, no different than Facebook except big different from Facebook. Here you can broadcast to all of LinkedIn, just your connections, or you can do LinkedIn and if you're on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn has a connection with Twitter. They don't have one with Facebook that I'm aware of, but you can do the same thing or Google Plus or stumble upon but you can do it with Twitter. I don't use it, the feature uh, to broadcast to Twitter when I directly post from LinkedIn. I did try it for a while. It was okay. I prefer to do Twitter natively through other uh, social tools. Um, I always broadcast everywhere because I figure what I have to say is of interest to everyone. But you may just want, if you have very tight connections, if you're not a, an open networker, as I have tended to be, you may only want to broadcast just your connections. That, again, is a choice. A strategic choice you should make in terms of your marketing and sales uh, uh, goals and objectives. So um, that was the way to broadcast to everyone. I want to move now to groups. Groups are where the action is. Groups are where you make connections and groups is where you can make connections for sales and marketing. I think more than any other venue within LinkedIn. You can join a maximum of 50 groups and I say join, um, join 50 pick the 50 best groups. I actually think that for a while I thought, why only 50? I think I should be to join as many. I actually agree with LinkedIn's cap on 50 groups. And the reason why is I think that some people are group hoarders um, and they will join every single group. Like you go on Facebook and join every single page and you don't know what the person is really interested in. The fact that you can only join 50 groups is an advantage because when you look at somebody and you look at their profile, you can see the exact groups are in. You can get a really good idea of what they're interested in. And that groups are also a backdoor uh, access to making direct connections. Normally, you can make connections by using InMail, which is direct email to anyone within LinkedIn, so it doesn't have to be someone you're connected to. Or you can use LinkedIn introductions, where you can ask a second degree connection to introduce you to a third degree, or you could ask um, you could use the introductions to, to reach out to people, to be introduced by people you know, so you can make business connections. Another way to do that is to join a group in which um, a person that you want to connect to is a member. Then you, once you do that, you can then uh, email that person directly. So that's the direct backdoor. And uh, I think it's the most efficient way, but I'm not going to, Sherry reminded me that we should also remember that we have in-mail available to us and we have LinkedIn introductions. And um, you should decide which one of those methods you'd like to use. Uh, personally and professionally, I found um, that using LinkedIn groups to connect with people and then go offline and do business has been the most successful strategy for me. I do know lots of people who use InMail to make connections and introductions. So I think they're all very valid and all very effective. In the sections in groups, um, this is not always clear, and I think this is one of the areas where LinkedIn could improve, but there are four basic sections, discussions, promotions, 
jobs and jobs discussions. Uh, just to remind you that when you see the jobs tab, when you go uh, into the LinkedIn um, website, the, those aren't paid listings. Okay. The jobs discussions is where if you have a job opportunity or you want to discuss jobs, that's where you are able to do those with no cost. Before you join a group or when you join a group, make sure you read the group rules. Every group has different rules and mostly it's related to what you can post, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate, and where you should post. This is one of the biggest hang-ups with people uh, in LinkedIn is posting the wrong kinds of posts or content to the wrong sections. And there's, there are ways that LinkedIn could fix this, they haven't so far, and then it's left to the members and the group managers to sort of police this. So it's better if you self-police, and I'll explain that as I go further. Um, every group has a specific rules, and your goal should be when you're posting in groups that you follow those rules so that you are not managed by members or the LinkedIn administrators. Joel, yes, we have a question from Krista. Uh, where can you find the group rules? It's a good question. Uh, <laughs> It's a very good question. So when you when you go to, uh, you know, that's another failing of LinkedIn because I'm often, you know, I go out of my way. When someone is misposting a lot, I will send them a private email saying, by the way, here's the group rules. Um, please go, you know, review them. And usually people say, oh, thank you. I never knew. The group rules, there's a link in the upper right corner of your screen, and it'll say group rules, and it'll be uppercase G groups and lowercase R for the rules, and you'll see it as a little piece of text along the line to the right of all the tabs. So they don't like to make it obvious. No, it's not obvious at all. I wish they would do a better job of presenting that because those group rules are very important for helping giving you guidance on what the post, and there's reasons why, and I'll, when we get to towards the end of the presentation, why you absolutely, when we're done with this webinar, you are going to follow those group rules to the letter because of a new rule or a new a new a policy that LinkedIn put in place in the last month or two, and we'll get to that shortly. So posting to a group, um, if you look here at the screen, I've done a screenshot, if, you're, I, if you were to go to the right of where it says the word more, the group rules would be to the right of that. So you can see that we have discussions. It's a tab, and uh, a lot of people don't recognize there's also something called promotions. And why promotions isn't right next to discussions, I have no idea. And then there's jobs, which you can't really uh, do anything with unless you pay LinkedIn, I think, $300 for every listing. And so when you click on jobs, I'll go there first, you can see that there's these jobs on the right. Those are the paid listings. And on the left, you're going to see jobs discussions. If you have a job opportunity that you'd like to place at no cost in a group, that's where you do it. You don't put it in discussions and you don't put it in promotions. But you would be surprised, probably 50% or more of the, of the jobs that are listed go right into discussions and then have to be manually moved by the group administrator or by a member who flags that posting, it's a, at which basically pulls it out uh, for uh, moderation by the group administrators. You don't want to be doing that because your, your posts may never see light of day if you do that. So uh, when you look at the, the LinkedIn uh, posting screen, you s here's, here's other things that I think are kind of goofy. It says start a discussion or share something within, with the group. Right? What does that mean? And then it has this thing, add more details. What does that mean? Attach a link, uh, that's pretty clear. Um, and then it's got this number over here, it says 200. And I guess you, you can kind of gather what that means is that 200 characters. So it's bigger than Twitter. And you think, wow, I've got 200 characters to work with. That's true and kind of untrue. So when you're doing a post, whether it's for discussions, promotion, or jobs, you need to think about the strategic way to do this and ways to make take this to your advantage and ways that you can take this to a disadvantage. So um, be before I go on, I just want to summarize. If you post the discussions, LinkedIn is about networking. It's about discussions. It's not about posting, here's my product, here's my service. So discussions is designed for, and this is generally the way it is for most of the groups on LinkedIn. Questions, ideas, trending topics, interesting articles, 
And if you post a link for an interesting article, here's a little side note, say why you're posting it. Uh, technical tips, news, advice. Promotions are where companies um, can offer, here's my webinar, white papers, products, meetings, conferences, events, services, anything you want that is essentially direct selling your products and services. So back Joel? to the screen. I'm sorry, yeah. can I just interrupt for a sec before you move on? We had a couple of clarifications. Um, Nancy Zero was just wandering around LinkedIn while you were talking and said she noticed that some of the groups she's in do not have that group rules link, so you may have to search to find it. Okay. Uh, there are, and then uh, I just want to comment that some of the things I'm saying here are predicated on whether the administrators for the group have enabled certain settings. For example, um, you may not be aware, but we, uh, a, a group administrator can remove promotions and job uh, discussions as tabs. So all we could show is discussions. I don't know why you'd want to do that because I think you need to have the promotions section available because a lot of people want to post, a lot of people do post um, products, services, webinars, things not related to the group per se. Uh, and the promotions is the most obvious place to put that. You can disengage those services. This gets into the area of the administration of the group, so it's possible there is a setting, I'm not aware of that, where you can disable group rules. I've never seen that, but I will look into that afterwards and I can send a note to everyone that's here at the webinar, see what I found out. I'm yeah, and that, that was disengaged. Some administrators are better than others. There's some who actually are fairly incompetent and don't really do anything, and others are very actively involved. Um, let me just mention one more question, Joel, while I've, I've got you taking a breath here. Uh, Jay asks, how do you unlink one of your existing connections? Oh, that's a good one. That's another uh, complaint I would have with uh, LinkedIn. You can do it. You get there through a circuitous route. Um, you have to pull up all of your, there's a, you have to go to all of your connections and you have to do a search and you'll see them all done alphabetically. You go to that connection and you'll see a command to disconnect from that person. So it is doable, but it's not easy. And um, I don't have any slides to show you how to do that. That would be a whole separate drill down. But it is, you, you, every, anyone, who's try, anyone who does this, every time I have done it, and it's not that often, um, I only do that with somebody who starts spamming me, spamming me with email. I find every time I do it, I think, oh, how did I get to that point? You know, you've got to do a search on, in the member directory of your connections. All right? So let's go back to um, discussions and promotions. Um, a lot of people post things. Uh, in the ISA group, and I've gone to a lot of other groups to see how things are posted there, and most of the, uh, I wouldn't say most, but a lot of the content is actually promotional content. And so what happens with that content is a group admin, if, if it's an actively managed group, and you really only want to join actively managed groups, or else they will become spam boxes, that content will get moved by the administrators, or it will be flagged by members if the administrators allow or enable members to flag content. And when content is flagged, it gets pulled from circulation and gets set aside for the administrators to review. So your goal should be actually to take a promotion that you might have and see how you can make it a discussion. Figure out a way that you can turn sale, a sales and marketing objective into a discussion because discussions are, are where people go. They don't go to promotions as much as they go to discussions. Discussions are the first thing that you see. So I'm going to show you how to do that. And again, five minutes, that's all I'm asking for of your time to change the way you do business on LinkedIn to achieve that goal. So if you post it, will it fit? Remember we talked about the 200 characters you can do? Well, yeah, you can do 200 characters, but the problem is, is if you just post the one line, and this went into that first of the two fields that you can enter text on. So, you know, give me your status, give me an update. This is their version update. It's a linkable piece of text that links to the full amount of information that you actually typed for the, in that 200 characters. My recommendation is don't exceed 130 characters and they'll be able to see all of the text from what I call the headline of a LinkedIn post. Okay, So in the start of discussion, that's your headline. That will link to your full post. Give, give the reader all the text you want to deliver. The second thing is Add more details, the supporting text. That's also limited to view 130 characters. 
So be careful with what you do there. You, you probably are going to have to do more than 130 if you're going to do a long explanation. And for the link, attach the link to the attach a link field. You can drop a link into the start of discussion field, and it will be linkable, but it's very ineffective. I see it done all the time, and I'm going to show you examples of, of how it is ineffective. Here's an example of where somebody went into a group and they posted in the start of discussion a link. And the link resolved the title of the article and and it shortened the link to this. So this is how it looks. You know, to me, not all that great. And the only um, customization that the poster did in this case was write great article. Well, what does that tell me? And why should I engage? Why should I comment on this? You know, the, 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 the uh, poster in this particular case is not attempting to engage. The poster in this simply dropped a link, wrote great article, and hoped it might get my attention. Now, if I take this same article, this gets my attention. You can notice that there is a customized uh, start a discussion, or what I call the headline, which is linkable, which uh, if there was more text in the details, that would open this up to the wider amount of information. Notice that there is a secondary line where questions are being asked. What is this? This is the call to action. This is telling me how do I engage with this further. And then finally, drop the link in there and it does all the work for you. You don't need to let your, your, um, your headline take care of all that. You've got now more opportunity to easily have more content in your post. It's all done for you. So leverage everything that LinkedIn has to offer. Fill out every field. Remember, 130 characters are viewable until you expand the post. So here's um, three examples of call to actions. Joel, People can I pause you for a sec? Yeah. I have a couple of questions here. So um, Nancy, I think that answers your question. Uh, Nancy just asked if LinkedIn automatically converts URLs to tiny URLs or whatever. Yes, it's all automatic. You can put in a tiny URL. You can put in a full URL. It doesn't matter. LinkedIn will handle it. Um, uh, she had another question, though, that I wanted to just get to before we got too far along the line. It's um, about breaking rules and stuffing promotions into discussion areas. Um, yeah. and Nancy asks, you know, if you're reprimanded privately, um, isn't there now a problem that no one else sees it, the private reprimand and so they continue to do it? Um, you know, you kind of have to make it obvious that there's not a green light here to just post all your sales promotions in the discussion area is absolutely the wrong place to be. Um, I don't, I would never reprimand someone publicly. I consider that to be unprofessional. I'm not sure if that was the question. So um, how do you what, then let others know that they need to stop it? Aren't you just going to end up with a lot oh, of people? Oh, here's, here's what I, here's what I do. I send a private note to the person explaining that the content, this type of content should be posted in this section. We're more than welcome to do it there. Or if, you know, if, if, for example, the ISA group, if someone posts a sale on sweaters and T-shirts at a site in Hong Kong, I'll say that's inappropriate for this group. Don't even post this here. So I'll send them a private note. I will say that I started doing that, um, and I will say that about 50% of the time I get a note back saying, thank you for clarifying. The other 50% of the time my experience has been I'm totally ignored and they continue to post inappropriate or misplaced content. Is then what helpful? do you do? Uh, let's go forward and I'll explain what I can do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, or what any administrator can do. And remember, members can do similar things. And if I get enough input from members, I can take further action. So just I want to go quickly, besides doing a standard post, Remember that you have the option to do a poll, and you can, as long as it's enabled by the group administrators. Okay, so some of some groups have these disabled. So some things, if you don't see them, it's because administrators have disabled some of these settings. But polls can be effective, and they do get comments, so you can get engagement. Um, here are the th here are the kinds of things that I see getting posted in discussions. Uh, hey, here's a, a case study. Please, please uh, click this. Well, the problem I have with this is when you click on the link, you're immediately brought to a screen that says, give me your name, address, and all your details. 
and you have to decide if you're in sales and marketing for a company or for your own business whether you want to make a person do a two-step that's come to LinkedIn. Now, normally in LinkedIn or in any site, when you click on a link, you expect to receive immediacy. You expect to get the white paper or get the recording or go right to the YouTube. So you expect to go there right away. So understand that you're asking people to do something that they may not feel they have time to do. In this case, it's interesting because if, in this, if you type in your details, you'll then get a link. You'll get immediately go to a link to, to download this case study. But if you type in any email address, you'll still get the same link. So they're really not requesting this. My strategy, my recommendation is consider instead of making the person fill out this detail here, put the request in the actual case study itself, or in this case, here's a webinar request. Instead of asking them to fill out their name and so forth in this, at, you know, do the call to action in the actual content that you're bringing the person to. A lot of advantages to that because you're bringing them to your site. You're, you're essentially driving that traffic anyway to your website or to your YouTube site. So you've already got them. You've already got them reading or watching. That would be the place I would prefer to put the, hey, can I have your name and address? I'd like to send you more information. Um, here's a case where just pure this is a, pro a page from a um, website. With, it's just a product uh, brochure, and they just drop it right in discussions. What happens to this? I see it, or members see it. It gets flagged, or it gets moved into promotions. So um, it actively, actively managed groups. You don't see a lot of this because it's being pulled all the time. I think there is a way, and actually it's a recommendation I would make to LinkedIn. There is a way to stop all of the spam in LinkedIn. And it'd be very easy. And actually, I'll be doing a post on that shortly. I want to show you the anatomy of a wonderful post that does a wonderful job of selling and marketing for an individual and a company. So here's how it shows up. We've got a headline, and you can read the whole thing. You don't see dot, 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 which means we're under 130 characters. We have the details. Now, the details get longer, so you do have to click to go forward on this, and we do have a link to an article, and the, link, and the, and the article has a graphic, and LinkedIn resolved that graphic. So you have a very a visually appealing post, and when you click on the link to expand this post out, and you read this thoroughly, I'm not going to have you read this now, there's not a single cell for a product in this. This is a, a pure act of engagement by this individual. And I say, wow, this is really interesting. And when I read this, the first thing that I did was I said, who is this person posting all of this good content on this subject related to security and buildings? I want to know more about him. And when I went to this person's profile, the next thing I found was, who do you work for? And he works for a, leading, a leader in buildings, automation, uh, and security. I want to know more about this company more about what they sell. I will, I will acknowledge that the person who posted this is a person in business development and sales and marketing. So he knows what he's doing and did a good job at it. So this is a perfect example and you can see these. And I don't think that this took more than five, maybe ten minutes of time to take an article, post it, add some engaging content and say, I know a lot about this subject. What do you think about it? Let's engage. He's prospecting for business and doing it very well. So remember that the LinkedIn is a selling cycle. You have discussions, which leads to engagement, which builds your reputation, which is part of your LinkedIn profile, because you've crafted and sculpted and polished your LinkedIn profile. And once I reach your LinkedIn profile, I reach your company, and then I reach your products and services. And it's a cycle that goes back to discussions. It's this cycle that leads to sales and marketing and LinkedIn. Joel, just a reminder, we're at 12.52. Sorry, 9.52. And we are, we are minutes away. So <laughs> watch out. Most groups are set to be moderated by managers and members. Post the appropriate section. Um, when you get flagged, when you post to the wrong section, like discussions, you are, your brand is diminished immediately with two people. The administrator who has to deal with it, or and or the member who flagged your post, and so you've already you've already started down the wrong road. Um, there's a new LinkedIn policy on members that are blocked. In other words, if I opt to block somebody, they can't post to this group at all. 
something you all need to be aware of when you are blocked you will require moderation in all the groups that you are a member of your account will be changed across the board in LinkedIn you don't want to be in LinkedIn jail so this is what happens you when you go to post something you can see under every post if you click the more tab you'll see you can flag it as promotion a job or is inappropriate you want when you post something you do not want anyone clicking on that more tab and, and flagging any of these so just a summary focus on discussions you know deliver LinkedIn it's your business card and engage um, multiple group posting same content a lot of risks on this if you have the same piece of content do not take it cut and paste it into 10 groups I'll see it everyone will see it they're gonna see that you're basically just doing drive-bys so how do you do that five minutes for each one change the content in each one put a different um, call to action a different kind of engagement different text yes it's more work you'll look much better post in different days to avoid the repetition because I'll go from one group to another than a similar area and I'll see the same post by the same person one after the other and it doesn't look great so make it look great change the text change the message make it customized for the theme or topic of the group um, watch your frequency I'll see some people will come in and will post five six seven even in the promotion section which I don't really stop but then you'll see a big laundry list of the same company or same individual posting doesn't look great so if you have to do it space it out I'll often, I'll often wait if I have multiple posts to let other people post so that it's interspersed okay sell your reputation and your resource first then your products and services drive the traffic to you to your profile which will drive to your business and from there you can drive your product sales or your service sales make every post an opportunity to engage or discuss don't just drop a link in there there's no there's no engagement and in fact I've seen comments a number of times where people will just sarcastically click the comment thing and says nice nice post well what's the discussion literally what is the discussion you know they're begging the posters to actually discuss something finally I just want to say and I only have five minutes left um, and I only have 30 seconds left on the slide endorsements I consider endorsements to be a poke some people like them I think I it's like them a, <laughs> it's a shortcut but I believe it's a shortcut by LinkedIn for people who don't want to spend the time to write recommendations I recommend if you're going to use endorsements poke people you know it's not a sales and marketing strategy unless you know the person and knowing the person is more than being a, a member of the same group it means you actually know the person okay you've met them you have worked with them and I do enjoy getting an endorsement from somebody that I know but when I get an endorsement for somebody who you know because I'm an open networker it's somebody who just said I'm in the same business I'm in the same industry or you know I just like the fact that you like this other person um, that they poke me and say you're great at um, you know playing a three-person chess you know if I put that down as a specialty um, well how do they know that I like three-person chess and I only use an example because I watched an episode of the Big Bang Theory last night <laughs> and they were talking about this game that was created by Sheldon called three-person chess I mean if somebody says that I'm great at social media or reputation management and and they're not at all a person that I know I, it, it it seems rather odd so I'm not real big on endorsements and there are rumors that endorsements may may have a short shelf life so that's my presentation on LinkedIn and I think that you can with only adding five more minutes to a post turn up from being simply here's some information here's a link to I'd like to engage with you I'd like to engage with people on this topic and the subtext of that is the sub strategy is if I engage with people I can then weave my sales and marketing into that engagement thank you very much thank you Joel um, if there are any other questions post them now I just want to answer let's see Leanne asked uh, commented great webinar thank you for hosting it will we get a recorded copy so um, yes I am recording and we will make this available I forget where we put it where do we put it Joel on YouTube 
we can put it on YouTube or we can put it uh, on, I'm not sure we can do it on SlideShare. But we'll I put, put the slides. The channels. Yeah, typically I put the slides on SlideShare and then the recording will go on to YouTube. And yes, everyone who's registered will get a copy of those links. So um, not a problem. Uh, thank you, Joel. That was a lot of great information. And uh, as we were, as I was listening to you again, I realized there's a couple of um, subtopics we could do whole separate webinars on, um, and uh, and we may yet do that. Uh, uh, Krista says, great, thank you, and um, thank you all. We're ending exactly on time. I'm so excited. Uh, if you have any follow-up questions, you can email me or you can email Joel. Uh, you can also post um, questions to the ISA Marketing and Sales accounts on the various social media. We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. Uh, uh, we're on LinkedIn. You name it. So thank you all. Have a wonderful day. And uh, we'll be talking to you again soon. Thanks, Joel. Take care. Thank you.